and will be co-chairing this symposium together with my co-chair, Professor Maya Thrush, a neurologist from University Medical Center, Ljubljana. And we have some very interesting talks planned for today that will cover a variety of different topics related to brain imaging, um, all the way from using multimodal approaches for modeling and pathophysiology of different neurodegenerative diseases, novel, novel analytical techniques. And we'll also take a look at different technical factors uh, that can affect, affect the image. And in the second part of the symposium, we'll focus on the different metabolic network imaging biomarkers. And now I'm inviting Professor Trush to share some of her thoughts. Thank you, Matei. I will be really short. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the uh, following talks and the discussion. And I'm just heading over to you, Matei. Okay, thank you. And just before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone <clears throat> that you can still submit your question via the live stream page, and you'll see the box on the right part of the screen next to the video. And with that, it's now my um, pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Nikolai Franzmeier. Dr. Franzmeier is the principal investigator and junior research group leader at the Institute for Stroke and Dementia Research at the University Hospital in Munich, Germany, and today he'll address the concept of connectivity-mediated tau spreading in neurodegenerative tauopathies. Thank, thank you, Matei. Hi, and hi, and welcome, everyone. I'll just uh, briefly start sharing my screen. Um, all right. Um, you should be able to see my screen now. Hopefully, the only one slide, right? Yes. But Okay, perfect. Good. Um, then I can basically start. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure uh, to introduce our work um, here at this conference. Um, and the topic of my talk will be on mechanisms of tau pathology spreading in Alzheimer's disease and for repeat tauopathies. And I'll start with introducing our work on Alzheimer's disease. And first of all, give a very brief introduction uh, of our current understanding of Alzheimer's disease. So we nowadays have a biological definition of Alzheimer's disease, or short AD, uh, which starts with the deposition of beta amyloid in the brain, which is then followed by the expansion of tau pathology. So these are the two defining features of the disease. And together, this leads to, in the long run, to neurodegeneration, and of course, the cognitive decline and dementia, which we observe clinically. And our lab in Munich has a particular interest in understanding the progression of primary Alzheimer's disease pathology. And today I'd like to introduce a work that we did during the last couple of years on better understanding the progression and expansion of tau pathology. So in its physiological form, tau is stabilizing the uh, microtubules within the axonal compartment of a neuron. However, in, um, in Alzheimer's disease, those microtubules disintegrate tau forms fibrils or tang or protofibrils uh, within the neuron. And very importantly, um, these tau fibrils can spread across synapses. So this has been extensively shown by uh, preclinical studies. And this spreading of tau pathology is really a key driver of cognitive decline. So while previously tau could only be staged using post-mortem assessments, we can nowadays visualize tau pathology in vivo using tau pet imaging. And we can use this postmortem based staging scheme of tau pathology and apply this to in vivo tau pet data. <clears throat> and here we found recently, together with others uh, who reported very similar and consistent findings, that the more widespread tau pathology is in the brain as indicated by a higher level Brock stage, the more rapid the subsequent cognitive decline will be. So basically, the expansion of tau pathology is a prognostic marker in Alzheimer's disease. And in our lab, we're basically trying to translate this connectivity-mediated tau spreading, which may give rise to the uh, spatial expansion and spreading of tau pathology in Alzheimer's disease to the level of in vivo neuroimaging. And to model the connection between brain regions, we use functional connectomics, mostly using resting state of MRI, where we map the connectivity between brain regions as the correlation in the bold time course that we record during fMRI. And we combine this connectivity assessments with a tau pet data that we obtain from mostly floor tau superior pet imaging. And in two of our very first studies, 
we um, aim to test whether functionally connected brain regions show correlated tau accumulation over time. And to this end, we combined longitudinal tau pet imaging in patients with Alzheimer's disease uh, with resting state of MRI connectivity data. And we parcelated both tau pet and fMRI data using a standard brain atlas that covers the neocortical brain surface and determined across patients the covariance in tau change. That means how well is the tau accumulation correlated over time between any two given regions. That's what this matrix indicates. And um, by applying the same parcellation to resting state of MRI imaging, we obtained a functional connectivity matrix indicating how strong brain regions are connected to each other, here indicated by darker blue colors. And when we looked at the linear association between these two matrices, we found indeed that regions that were more functionally connected to each other, shown on the x-axis, showed a higher similarity in their tau accumulation rate over time. And uh, this finding was here obtained in Adney, and we then went to a second fully independent cohort from our colleagues uh, led by Oskar Hansson in Sweden, where we could replicate this finding. So now these are whole brain data, um, but when we split this correlation plot up by the different brain networks that are composed or that are included in this brain parcellation, we see that this is a ubiquitous phenomenon. So across the entire brain, there is a quite strong correlation between the level of connectivity between brain regions and the covariance in their tau accumulation levels. So this is not confined to brain networks which are particularly vulnerable to Alzheimer's disease tau pathology. So based on these findings, we then asked whether we can in fact use the connectomic architecture of the brain to forecast how tau will spread uh, in Alzheimer's disease. And we first of all tackled this question using cross-sectional data, again looking at two independent cohorts of patients across the Alzheimer's disease preclinical to clinical spectrum. So these would be considered preclinical AD. These are still cognitively normal, but have elevated amyloid levels. Then we have people with mild cognitive impairment and elevated amyloid levels, and ultimately patients with AD dementia. And we then mapped the abnormality of tau PET across subjects and regions of interest that are included in the brain atlas that I introduced previously. And yellow regions here mean more, more abnormal tau. And basically what this allowed us to do is to identify regions which show relatively consistent and high tau accumulation early in the disease course versus brain regions which show rather late tau accumulation. So in which abnormal tau pet signals is relatively rare. And using this approach, we could also identify the epicenters of tau pathology. And we call epicenters, uh, we call them epicenters because we believe that these are the regions in which tau emerges first, which is very well in line with histopathological data um, that these epicenters are found in the inferior temporal lobe. So we then took these epicenters and mapped the connectivity pattern, again, using resting state of MRI of these epicenters. And you can already see by just comparing the visual match between the connectivity pattern of the epicenters and the tau spreading sequence, which is shown here uh, in this plot. And what we found is that there was quite a very strong resemblance between the connectivity of the epicenters and the set and spreading sequence of tau where regions that are closely connected to the epicenter showed early tau abnormality, and those brain regions which are connected only weakly to the epicenter show relatively late tau accumulation. So what this result here suggests is that tau starts in the inferior temporal lobe and then spreads throughout connected regions until basically the entire system is filled with tau pathology. However, what you can see from this plot is that there's quite some substantial heterogeneity in the tau deposition patterns, suggesting that not every individual falls in this Brach-like tau spreading trajectory. And this is very well known that Alzheimer's disease can manifest in quite a heterogeneous way, uh, which is particularly the case for the deposition of tau pathology. So we performed an independent component analysis-based decomposition uh, of uh, tau pet to try to identify different spatial patterns of tau pathology. So this was applied to the larger ATNI cohort, where we identified nine independent components, 
in which patients with Alzheimer's disease loaded higher than patients with, without Alzheimer's disease. And then we assigned the Alzheimer's disease patients back to this component space uh, based on the component on which they loaded highest. And this allowed us to identify subtypes of tau pathology, if you will, which just from the first, first visual impression clearly shows you that there is substantial heterogeneity in the deposition pattern of tau pathology. And then we try to use this heterogeneity to test whether our connectomic spreading models generalize towards these very heterogeneous tau deposition patterns and basically whether connectivity can explain heterogeneous tau spreading patterns. So I'll just pick out randomly two of these components here and start with this exhibitor temporal tau subtype, which is characterized as I just suggested by this exhibitor temporal predominant tau pathology, which is confined mostly to one hemisphere of the cortex. And then to emphasize how tau spreads within this subgroup of participants, we performed a sliding window analysis where we sorted individuals from low to overall high tau positivity and applied a window that we slid across the spectrum and obtained the mean tau deposition which within each of the windows. And this is just to show or to illustrate the spreading trajectory of tau pathology within this uh, subcohort of individuals, showing that while first there is hardly any tau deposition occurring, the first tau deposition that is observed is found here in the occipital pole, and then from there proceeds onwards to the remaining cortex. And then we applied again the analysis approach that I introduced previously. Uh, so we performed this hierarchical sorting, which allowed us to identify the epicenters of tau pathology highlighted here in green. And what we found again was that the connectivity pattern of the epicenters was highly predictive of the sequence in which tau supposedly spreads throughout the brain in this heterogeneous cluster of occipital tau deposition. And when I move to another subtype, which is this parietal tau subtype, uh, we performed basically the same sliding window approach and found the earliest tau deposition here in the lateral parietal lobe from where it spread, uh, spreads onwards to the remaining cortex. And by applying the very same methodolog me me methodology um, we identify again the epicenters here in the lateral parietal lobe and find that the connectivity pattern of the epicenters is a very good predictor of the actual spreading sequence of tau. So this was cross-sectional data, but what we want to achieve ultimately is to get to the patient level and take an individual's tau PET scan and make a prediction of how will his or her tau pathology progress in the future. And to this end, we came up with the following model uh, where we believe that define, we define a patient-specific epicenter of tau pathology at a given point in time, which is, for instance, just the region with highest tau pathology, then we expect the fastest tau accumulation in brain regions, which are actually most closely connected to the epicenter, where this effect fades out the further you get away from the epicenter in terms of connectivity. So basically what we expect is a gradient of tau accumulation over time from the epicenter throughout connected regions. And we applied this to three independent cohorts with longitudinal tau pet data. So what you see on the y-axis is the annual rate of tau accumulation that is split up by these Q1 to Q4 to Q3 and so on ROIs, which is just quartile one to quartile four. And these ROIs are defined for each patient independently based on where uh, a given patient's tau epicenter is located. And what we found is in line with our prediction that the regions that are most closely connected to a given patient's epicenter show the fastest tau accumulation over time consistently across all the three cohorts. And this is clinically re relevant because with this patient tailored um, assessment of tau accumulation, we're more sensitive to quantify the progression of pathology compared to rather agnostic measures that are con conventionally applied, like Brock staging or whole brain assessments. And if you translate this to a clinical trial where you could use tau PET as a surrogate endpoint, then the method that we propose can increase the power to theoretically detect treatment effects, which reduces the number of patients and also the costs 
that you need for conducting a clin clinical trial. So to sum this part up, uh, and then I'll move on to the four repeat tauopathies, uh, we believe that tau spreading patterns in Alzheimer's disease follow the connectivity of tau epicenters, indicative of this, what some people call this prion-like tau spreading pattern. Um, and that this is the case for these very typical BRAC-like tau spreading patterns, but also for more atypical and more heterogeneous spreading patterns. So we believe that connectivity is a uniform mechanism that gives rise to the heterogeneity in the tau spreading that we see. Second of all, we could show that we can use connectivity-based spreading models to predict where tau will accumulate next. So we make, can make it patient-tailored or precision medicine prediction that can help define patient-centered endpoints, uh, which can be used in clinical trials to reduce sample sizes. And with this, I would like to close the Alzheimer's chapter and then uh, in the last part of the talk, move to a um, second class of neurodegenerative diseases, which we recently got interested in, which are four repeat tauopathies. Because tau pathology is of course not confined to Alzheimer's disease, but also found in various other neurodegenerative diseases, suggesting that tau is somewhat like a common final pathway that occurs across different diseases. And the uh, unique or remarkable feature of these uh, four repeat tauopathies is that four repeat tau, which is a different isoform of tau pathology, is found not only in neurons, but also in glias and astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. And the two largest classes of these four repeat tauopathies are progressive supranuclear palsy, PSP, or corticobasal degeneration, CBD, which are to date still histopathologically defined. And depending on the pattern of tau deposition in uh, those patients, these tauopathies can manifest in very or a, a large heterogeneous class of clinical syndromes. So the tau distribution pattern determines the clinical phenotype that we see. And most commonly, um, these diseases manifest as Richardson syndrome, defined by postural instability, and Gaze palsy, or corticobasal syndrome. And what is the unique feature of these four repeat tauopathies is that they are mostly subcortical tauopathies. While Alzheimer's disease is more a cortical tauopathy, um, these tauopathies start really in the subcortex and then in the long run spread to the neocortex. And to, so previously, the only way to assess the um, level of 4 tauopathy was um, post-mortem staining, so histopathology. Um, however, with the um, advent of second-gen tau pet tracers, uh, and this is true only for Pyramol 2620, we can now also, to a certain degree, image 4 repeat tauopathies. So this tracer has a certain affinity to 4 repeat tauopathies. As you can see here, we see elevated subcortical binding in patients with PSP Richardson syndrome or non Richardson syndrome. And it also comes with the advantage of not suffering from the severe subcortical off target binding that we saw in first generation tau pet tracers. So, compared to healthy controls, you can clearly emphasize that there is a, um, a striking subcortical tau pet elevation in these patient cohorts compared to the healthy controls. And the major aim of this particular study was to um, test connectivity as a driver of tau spreading, also in these four repeat tauopathies to see whether we have a uniform mechanism that drives the spreading of tau. So we basically combined functional connectomic data with in vivo tau pet imaging using this new tracer here in Munich, um, together with post-mortem assessments for independent validation. And we first of all started with the tau pet images, which we parcelated into a cortical brain atlas and now also a subcortical brain atlas. Um, and then using cross-sectional data, determined the covariance in tau pet between regions of interest. That gives us an, an index of how well is tau correlated between two particular regions. And when looking at the subcortex only, we found that regions that were functionally connected to each other also showed a higher similarity in their tau levels, both for patients with PSP Richardson syndrome, as well as for people with corticobasal syndrome, which is a cross-sectional indicator of 
that connectivity may drive uh, the spreading pattern of tau pathology. And when we extend this to the cortex, we find a very consistent pattern suggesting that this is, as in patients with Alzheimer's disease, a rather ubiquitous phenomenon that we observe uh, throughout the brain. So in the next step, we then um, went to the patient level again, um, where we defined a given patient's epicenter of tau pathology, so the region with highest tau pet in the subcortex, and we reasoned that the highest tau pet levels should be found apart from the epicenter in those brain regions which are most closely connected to the epicenter. So again, this quartile one region of interest, which is defined for each patient individually, and that we expected a fading out of tau pathology uh, following this connectivity gradient. And in fact, in both groups, so in the CBS group, as well in, as in the PSP group, this was the pattern that we detected. So we found that the highest tau deposition was found when looking at the subcortex only in this Q1 ROI. And then there was this gradient of tau deposition following the connectivity pattern of the epicenters. And when we then moved to the cortex, we found again a very similar pattern suggesting that the spreading of tau pathology subcortically as well as cortically in these four p tauopathies may be driven to a certain degree by um, the connectivity pattern of the epicenter. Now, this work using TauPet has a couple of limitations that I want to highlight, because clearly in these four p tauopathies, TauPet cannot differentiate between neuronal tau or glial tau. Um, so whether there's tau in neurons, tau in astrocytes, or tau in oligodendrocytes, we cannot disentangle this with the tau pet signal, which of course comes from hundreds or thousands of cells in the brain. And in addition, we have still the hurdle of a certain degree of unspecific binding, which may additionally confound our analysis because pet imaging or tau imaging in 4P tauopathies is still in, in early days. So what we try or how we try to address it, this is by moving to histopathology. So we teamed up with um, neuropathologists who obtained histopathological tau assessments for astrocytes, neurons, and oligodendroglia for a different set of brain regions. So first following a very standardized protocol. And so based on these data, we try to perform a post-mortem replication of our tau pet imaging analysis and particularly test because we had cell specific data, whether the connectivity versus tau association is driven by neuronal tau. So what we did is we um, tried to reconstruct the autopsy protocols together with the neuropathologists in MNI standard space so that we have a common reference frame of where in the brain um, the probes were extracted. We had two independent samples, one from Munich, uh, one from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, both with roughly 100 patients, all of which had histopathologically confirmed uh, PSP, so for repeat tauopathy. And in a group of healthy controls from the ADNI cohort, we then took these ATLAS data and determined the connectivity between those regions to get a template of how interconnected are these brain regions for which the neuropathologists have obtained the tau, uh, the tau data. And by combining then these connectivity data from, from our healthy individuals with the uh, post-mortem tau data from the PSP patients, we could in essence perfectly replicate the findings that we obtained with tau pet previously. So we found that brain regions who showed high functional connectivity also showed a high similarity or covariance in their post-mortem assessed tau levels. And this here is the plot for neuronal tau levels only. So independent of astrocytic or oligodendric glial tau. And then in order to test whether this association here is really strongest for neuronal tau, we repeated this analysis using astroglial, oligodendric glial, neuronal tau and applying a bootstrapping iteration procedure to get a distribution of these beta values that quantify the association between connectivity and tau covariance. What you see is in both cohorts, again, that neuronal tau has the strongest association between connectivity and the covariance in tau, which is indicative that this tau spreading may be in fact mostly observed on, along neurons uh, where oligodendroglial and astrocytic tau may follow this pattern.
So to sum this very last part up, and then I'm uh, open to take your questions, we believe that our data shows that uh, not only in Alzheimer's disease, but also in four repeat tauopathies, that interconnected brain regions show correlated tau PET levels in people in which we have clinical diagnosis of four repeat tauopathies, uh, by the way, all of which are amyloid negative. So none of them has potentially confounding Alzheimer's disease pathology. And then second of all, that we find this gradient from subcortical epicenters to cortical or subcortical connected regions, which tau the position seems to follow, and that we could show using postmortem data that these effects may be, in fact, be the strongest for neuronal tau levels. Overall, suggesting this is really the, the key uh, take home message from this presentation that we believe that connectivity may be a uniform driver of tau spreading not only in primary tauopathies, but also in Alzheimer's disease and maybe other tauopathies as well. And with that, I would like to thank a large group of people, in particular Michael here in Munich, and Matthias also from our nuclear medicine uh, physician here in Munich, also Günther Höglinger, who is really the driving force between the 4AP tauopathy project together with Johannes Levin, the neuropathologists Gabor Kovac and John Trojanowski and Thomas Arzberger, who collected a majority of these data. And with this, I'm in time and very happy to take your questions. Okay, thank you, Nika, for this wonderful and insightful presentation. Uh, we have some questions. One was already um, tackled in quite detail about the role of tau in Parkinsonism, so I don't think we need to address this one. But maybe can you elaborate on how can the um, connectivity model that predicts the, the spreading of tau also predicts the clinical phenotype? This is a very important question, and this is something we're currently trying to address um, to see whether the heterogeneous tau spreading patterns predict clinical heterogeneity. And we have quite good evidence that this is the case. So, uh, and there are other papers as well showing that um, atypical AD, for example, which is really characterized by clinically atypical pheno phenotypes, that there is a large heterogeneity in the tau deposition patterns. For example, patients with posterior cortical atrophy show more or less occipital tau deposition. Patients with uh, progressive primary, uh, so PPA, show left hemispheric language um, type tau deposition. So there is a quite close clinical um, pathological match. And uh, we're currently trying to make use of this to predict patient tailored trajectories of cognitive decline, which as a short teaser works pretty well. So this is work in progress. Okay, then um, how early in the Alzheimer's continuum would you be able to apply this? Well, so basically um, many people or most people I would say, um, as we age, develop a certain level of tau um, pathology in the enterorhinal cortex. So the region which is corresponding to Brach region one, so where Heiko Brach and his wife um, assumed that this is where tau pathology starts in Alzheimer's disease. So we see it quite early on if there's fibrillary tau. Um, but tau really starts only to spread out when there's amyloid in the brain. Um, so um, I would say we can definitely detect some levels of tau pathology at the preclinical level when people are still asymptomatic, but the, really the majority of tau pathology starts spreading as soon as people uh, show cognitive symptoms because tau is really one of the key drivers of cognitive decline as I've shown previously. But it comes much later than amyloid. Okay, thank you. And maybe... Um... The last question. Um, so if you describe the type of connectivity that drives the tau um, propagation, uh, would you then be able to use this uh, connectivity patterns even before the tau begins to spread in individual basis? Um, I, would, I would believe so, but we need to know where tau starts. I think with, we, we need to know the starting site of the pathology in order to make a prediction of where it will go. If we do not know the starting site, then the prediction would be rather random. I mean, of course, there is a certain probabilistic distribution of where tau starts, um, such as the inferior temporal lobe, but we're seeing more and more that it's relatively heterogeneous. So we need, from the level of tau pet, we need to have 
a certain indicator of where is some signal in order to make a prediction. If there's no signal at all, then we can't make a prediction. Okay, thank you. And now we are uh, just in time for the end of the discussion. Thank you once again for the yeah, thank you. Um, presentation. And I think we can continue with our next speaker. Um, our next uh, speaker is Ali Ditch. Um, she is a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Medical Physics at the University of um, Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. And in her presentation, Dr. Ditch um, will showcase the development and interpretation of a deep learning model in order to distinguish patients with Alzheimer's disease from unaffected individuals. And Ali, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I, mean, I just wanna to start today by uh, doing a few thank yous. So first, thanks to my PI, Robert Urai, um, and to my colleagues and collaborators and the University of Wisconsin in Madison for helping make this research happen. So when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, um, clinical diagnosis is still not very reliable. So despite a plethora of testing options, there's currently a lack of a single comprehensive generalizable tool for establishing diagnosis. And this is a problem because it results in patients not receiving proper disease management and the development of any treatments is slow due to inaccurate cohorts um, and these inaccurate diagnostics. So we know that neuroimaging can show particular patterns or signatures in the brains of Alzheimer's patients, which are helpful for diagnosis. And while we know that imaging holds important information, there's no real consensus on which modality is best for this purpose. So MRI is most frequently used, partly due to its widespread availability, um, and this shows structural change, but FDG-PET may illustrate metabolic changes, which can happen prior to the onset of structural changes and potentially allow for earlier diagnosis relative to MRI and clinical symptoms. Now these two modalities and others are rarely compared directly in the same diagnostic model, which makes it very difficult to determine objectively their influence on model performance and which is best for diagnosis. So while many types of deep learning models have been developed for this purpose of Alzheimer's diagnosis, um, and there's a lot of great work that's been done in this area, it's difficult to know which model is best and how it should be employed. And this is because models are difficult to compare objectively and there are a large number of factors influencing their performance. And so it's still not well understood which features and inputs make one model more advantageous than another. So in this study, we present a novel deep learning model and systematically investigate the influence of imaging modality on its performance. So beyond imaging modality, there are a few other features which are important to consider to determine the advantages of a particular model. So one is the inclusion of longitudinal information. And this may, we hypothesize, improve classification accuracy as it has in other image analysis methods. Um, the second um, important feature is validation with an external data set. So the ability to generalize well um, to a new patient data set is a critical challenge for deep learning models, and especially for their translation. And the last thing is the addition of interpretability methods like attention heat maps. And these help move deep learning tools away from purely black box models. So the purpose of our work today is to develop a novel deep learning model to distinguish brain scans of patients with Alzheimer's disease from normal controls. The primary objective is to then investigate the influence of imaging modality on this model performance. And secondarily, we wanna explore whether the addition of longitudinal data affects the model. Um, we wanna determine how well the model generalizes to a new unseen external data set. And we wanna identify which regions are most influential to the model's decision. So the model we're using here is a convolutional neural net or a CNN with a cascaded recurrent neural net or an RNN. And so what we do is we train the two class CNN, both with and without this cascaded RNN. So the CNN takes in single time point brain scans and learns the spatial features of those scans. Um, and it, this, the CNN then outputs a class prediction of either normal or Alzheimer's disease. We then use the CNN to output feature maps of only patients with multiple time points within a two year range. So patients with one to two year gaps between their scans which we use as the input to an RNN. Um, and so we take up to three feature maps for each patient, input to the RNN, which learns temporal features and outputs binary class predictions for each patient. 
So to dive just a little bit deeper into this model, I'd like to call your attention just to a few um, critical features. So for one, the CNN inputs are both single time point images as well as clinical data. Um, and that's corresponding for each patient. The second um, interesting feature is this masking layer. So not every patient has all three time points. Um, and so this masking layer helps the, the model recognize when there is some missingness in a, in a patient's information. And the last thing here to call your attention to is that the RNN is made up of these bi-directional gated recurrent units or these um, gated rectified unit blocks or gated recurrent unit blocks, which take in the feature maps from all three time points and relate them to the scans both uh, forward and backward in time so that the, each time point is related to the time point on both sides of it in time. So that, that's how the RNN learns that temporal information. So the data set we compiled for this work was from ADNI, from the ADNI database. It's FDG PET scans and T1 weighted MR scans. Um, and you can see that we have, we, there were more PET scans available to us. Um, and the patient data, the clinical data we collected was just simply age and sex. So the scans were all pre-processed um, using SPM12, and you can see a couple of example scans here. So to dive a little deeper, a further breakdown of the makeup of each data set, um, note that we balanced each data set between classes before training the models. Um, so there's an equal number of Alzheimer's disease patients and normal controls. And the top row here is what data goes into the CNN, and the second row here is what data goes into the RNN. So we also use an independent data set for validation from the University Medical Center in Ljubljana with 104 single time point FDG PET scans. So we ran the model five times for each imaging modality with shuffled data, obtaining classification predictions from both the CNN alone, as well as the CNN with the cascaded RNN. And so plotted here are the average ROC curve over five runs with shuffled data and then we output the AUC or the area under this curve. We also calculated the accuracy at the optimal threshold um, as, as opposed to the a 0.5 threshold. So you can see the best performing variation of the model had a maximum AUC of 0.93, which is very promising. But now that we've shown that our model works with good success, we really wanna investigate the influences on this model. And if you recall the first one we wanted to, in, to investigate was imaging modality. So, in order to really investigate the influence of PET versus MRI, um, we really need, we needed to make sure that there was the same amount of data going into each model. So because we had more PET data in the CNN and more MR data in the RNN, we had to restrict these before we compared. So when we do this, we see a significant improvement in the model using PET data in both model types, both the CNN alone and the CNN plus RNN. You can see this by this distinct difference in the ROC curves and the AUC area under those curves. So one hypothesis here is that the MR images tend to vary quite a bit more from each other than PET images. So it's possible that using MR might require a larger or more harmonized data set in order to see the same performance as PET. The second objective uh, um, and feature we wanted to look at was whether longitudinal really affects the network's performance. So does adding the RNN really matter? And again, we needed to make sure that we matched the number of scans, the amount of information going into the CNN versus the RNN. So when we do that, we see a significant improvement in the model that incorporates longitudinal data, so the RNN model, when using PET data. We see this really nice separation here. But we don't see that same improvement with the MRI data. Um, and so, um, again, following that same hypothesis, it's possible that the MR scans are just too varied from one another for longitudinal change to offer much room for more distinct information. But in PET, we can say that longitudinal information offers significant improvement to the model. We also wanted to know whether our model generalizes well to new data. And so we looked at this external FDG PET data set from Ljubljana um, and classifying these 104 scans um, the model performs extremely well on this external data set, as you can see in the similarity of these ROC curves. And this is performed on the, the best run of the CNN model. Um, and so we can say that, in fact, the model does generalize well to new unseen data. 
And lastly, we wanted to know which regions of the brain are most important for the network's decision. So when it comes to checking this interpretability, there are many variations of attention heat maps. Um, we picked one that is class discriminative. So it only highlights the positive relevance or the importance of each voxel toward the specified class. So what we're showing here um, means that the hot areas on these plots indicate the most important voxels for the CNN's choice of Alzheimer's disease. We're looking at the average heat maps for just the AD patients. Um, and you can see that, or sorry, this particular method is called layer-wise relevance propagation or LRP. So um, you can see here that the, the um, same basic area is highlighted across both PET and MR, suggesting that um, the network is looking at the same region of the brain in both situations and moving us towards a little bit better understanding of how this model is actually working. So just to conclude, um, I showed a deep learning network for Alzheimer's disease diagnosis with a maximum AUC of 0.93, really encouraging performance. We found that the PET trained network outperforms that of MRI and that adding lot of longitudinal information offers significant improvement to the model performance, at least in the case of PET data. We also found that the CNN model generalizes well to an external data set and that um, looking at these heat maps may move this work toward the identification of a quantitative imaging biomarker for all centers. Thanks, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks, Sally, for the presentation. And while we are waiting uh, for the question from the audience, uh, may I ask you, how did you choose the, um, the first architecture of your deep learning model? Was it something that you used from a database or did you build it from scratch? Yeah, so um, the CNN is adjusted from someone else's work. So the, the, C, the first portion of it that learns the spatial features um, is just expanded upon from work I found in literature that, that did really great performance with MRI. Um, and I was just encouraged by their, their work. Um, and then I found another um, option in the literature that combined a CNN and an RNN in a slightly different way that I'm doing here. But so the, the combination of the CNN and RNN is where this particular model is novel. Um, and, and so I was inspired by other people's work, but kind of made my own tweaks on that combination. Okay, thanks. Um, and then the next question um, would be, have you looked also um, earlier in the disease course or so before the dementia stage? So in the MCI individuals? We have super briefly, um, and that's kind of the next hope for the use of this model is to apply this to, to MCI patients. Um, in theory, this model could be used to predict like whether or not those MCI patients will progress. Um, and so that's what, that's the next application we would love to apply this model to. And, and ADNI has enough data to be able to do that theoretically. Okay, great. And then we have a technical question from the audience. Um, since the data is uh, quite high dimensional, how long did the training um, take? Honestly, it's very fast. Um, um, five to 10 minutes per run so, uh, on, a, on a GPU. So. Great. Uh, that, was a, that was a short one. Uh, then we have a, a question from Nico um, asking if you um, can judge the heat, mass, heat maps because they um, show the regional relevance of PET data uh, for the discriminative accuracy because they did not include um, all the AD typical regions that you would um, normally expect. Right, right. And, and we don't really expect the heat maps to give us a full pattern of AD. Um, it's, not, it's not quite the same as, as other types of pattern recognition models. Um, the heat map will, it, it is curious that it's at least not um, like bilateral across the, the areas of the brain. <clears throat> Our best hypothesis here is that um, it's really just picking one. And, and since AD is, is typically symmetric across the brain, um, the model only needs to look at one side. Um, that, that's, that will require some more exploration for sure though, and, and maybe comparison to different types of heat maps, but yeah. Okay, and did you do any, um, one final question, any data augmentation um, when training the model? Nope, just um, just pre-processing of these images and then just training with these specific images. Um, we thought we might have to do augmentation, 
but it turned out that we had pretty good performance without it. Maybe the, the MRI data would benefit from that um, type of augmentation because you'd see more similar scans. Um, and so that's, it's maybe something to explore if you're limited to MR data. But since we found good success with the PET, we, we found we didn't need to add the augmentation. Okay, thank you so much uh, for sure. the presentation, for the discussion, and enjoy the rest of, uh, the, rest of the symposium. Great, thank you. Then um, I think we can proceed with the program. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mauro Namias, and he's the current head of medical physics at the Nuclear Diagnostic Center Foundation in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And his presentation will address various technical factors uh, that affect image quality in positron emission tomography. So moving um, from the disease stages to the technical factors. And Mauro, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matei. Let me try to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. It's working okay, well. thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today at Synapsa conference. And as Matei said, I am going to speak about technical factors affecting image quality in PET. Of course, not all of them, but the most important. So as an introduction, image quality in PET in general, but also in NeuroPET might be affected by many technical and biological factors. And in this talk, we will focus on two of them, just two of them, spatial resolution and noise properties. And as an important point, I would like to say that optimization of image quality might be different for different tasks. One main group of tasks is the detection of a pattern or a lesion or, a, or some pathologic situation in the brain versus quantification of the uptake in the brain. And these are required quite often different approaches that I will highlight. Moving to spatial resolution, the spatial resolution on reconstructed images depends on many factors, the most important being the positron range of the tracer that we are using. Uh, the higher the positron range, the lower the spatial resolution. Also, we have photo non-collinearity that uh, is affected by the PET ring diameter. If we use a clinical whole body PET scanner, the resolution will be lower than for a dedicated brain scanner. And we also have detector design where smaller scintillation crystals will typically uh, lead to a higher spatial resolution, but with a trade-off of the photon detection sensitivity. But in this talk, I would like to focus mainly on reconstruction algorithm and settings and how that impacts both uh, detection and quantification of neurological patterns. So this is a, an image formation model that uh, we developed. Uh, and after a sufficient number of reconstruction iterations, such as with the OSEM algorithm, we can linearize the spatial resolution of the reconstructed image by stating that the observer, the observed image, the, the image that we will analyze can be approximated by the convolution of the ideal tracer distribution, the ideal activity concentration, with the point spread function of the system. The point spread function is basically if we put a very small point source in the field of view, how it gets reconstructed or represented in image space. So uh, typically what we, what we get is a blurred version of the underlying activity distribution. And this affects uh, most heavily objects or structures that are small compared with this spatial resolution characterized by the PSF. But also we have to consider the, the effect of noise. And this is typically modeled with an additive noise term, but this noise term in PET is signal dependent. This basically means that the noise variance is proportional to the mean number of counts or the, the mean activity concentration in that voxel. So one convenient way to characterize the effect of both spatial resolution and noise is through the use of contrast recovery coefficients, which are defined as the ratio between the measured activity uh, in the image against the real underlying activity concentration that we 
can know, for example, with a dose calibrator. And these contrast recovery coefficients are typically plotted as contrast recovery coefficients against an object or sphere size. And CRCs can summarize complex 3D spatial resolution and noise properties in convenient one-dimensional numbers or scalar numbers. One meaning that we have a perfect recovery of the signal, lower than one meaning that we have lower recovery than ideal. So one easy way to estimate these contrast recovery coefficients is through a novel method that we published a couple of years ago that it uses a cylindrical phantom that is filled with, for example, uh, FDG or Florian AD FDG, from which the point spread function and noise power spectrum is easily estimated in an automated way. And that information is used to simulate uh, realistic spheres from ideal spheres and finally estimate the contrast recovery coefficients. So CRCs can be estimated in an easy uh, procedure which is fully automated. And also this toolbox or methodology could be easily extended to simulate custom objects such as an, brain, uh, an image of the brain. I here leave uh, the QR code in case you are interested in downloading this open source toolbox. As a practical example, we also have to consider that overall noise level, for example, characterized by the standard deviation of the noise, decreases with the square root of the activity time product. This means that in, from a practical uh, example, if we have a fourfold increase in acquisition time or injected activity, noise is reduced to one half. So we have the square root of time in this case. And in this plot of CRC max versus sphere diameter, we can see that going down from 20 minutes to five minutes acquisitions, the noise component goes to the uh, two times the noise that we have for 20 minutes when we go down to five minutes. Here we can see the effect of the number of reconstruction iterations on image quality, both on uh, spatial resolution and noise. If we start with the low number of uh, updates, which is the product of iteration and subsets, we get a blurred image, but with low noise. As we increase the total number of iterations, the spatial resolution goes up, but also does the image noise. So when should we stop? What's the optimal cutoff point? Well, if we analyze the effect of iterations on a simulation without noise, with, or would be equivalent to an infinite counts or infinite acquisition time, we can see that a spatial resolution com uh, conversions of a spatial resolution after only 28 updates, after which we don't get any gain in the spatial resolution. So why continue iterating? So in this case, this number of iterations would be optimal with regards to a spatial resolution. If we continue iterating, we are only amplifying noise. If we add noise to the simulation, for example, with, for a typical 20 minute acquisition of a neuro brain imaging, we can also see that as we increase the total number of iterations, the impact of noise becomes, becomes higher and higher. And in this particular example, the lower overall bias is also obtained with a low number of iterations, in this case, two iterations on 14 subsets, which is the bold line highlighted in the graph. If we focus on uh, pattern detectability, uh, mostly related to the human observer performance, a useful metric is the noise equivalent quanta, or NEQ, which can be thought of a window through which the observer sees the signal that is looking for. And thus, this NEQ quantifies how much of the frequency content is transmitted through the imaging and reconstruction process. This NEQ is basically the ratio between the resolution of the scanner divided with the noise power spectrum or the, the, how much noise is for any particular frequency. So in, in this previous example, if we plot this NEQ versus spatial frequency, we see that as we increase the number of iterations, this window or this useful window goes down, meaning that lesion detection or a specific pattern detection would be harder as we increase the number of iterations due to the increase in noise. So detectability might be higher at low iterations. Also, some modern scanners include the PSF modeling in this 
image for construction, but we should use this with a caution if we are interested in quantification, since it can, in, can introduce over or undershoots near sharp edges, as you can see in this particular example. Here we can see the comparison between 3D traditional OSEM and PSF reconstruction. This will give to very different quantification curves of CRCs. And this difference between different scanners can be easily corrected or compensated with appropriate post filters. In this case, we can see the, the same image for constructed with PSF, but with a post filter of five millimeters full width half maximum, which minimizes the differences between CRC values between reconstructions. So to conclude, image quality in Europet is affected by reconstruction settings. Reconstruction optimization is different for detectability against quantification uh, objectives. Increasing the number of iterations isn't always better because uh, noise is increased. And reconstruction settings can be easily optimized with an open source toolbox, which you can be free to download. And PS, PSF modeling should be used with caution for quantitative purposes due to the, this over quantification for some spatial frequencies. But these effects can be eliminated or mitigated with adequate post filters. So thank you very much for your, your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thanks, Mara, uh, for presenting. It was really interesting work. And while we are uh, waiting for uh, for the questions, um, maybe I, I can ask you. Um, so, how much? Um, difference between different scanners do you see in terms of how um, equipment involved improved in the recent years versus I know a decade or old scanner? Uh, that's a good question and I would say that the difference between different scanner models might be smaller than what you can modify inside a single scanner meaning that even if everyone had the same scanner model if you change the reconstruction settings, the impact could be higher than the impact of different acquisition technologies. Uh, having said that, I think that the main difference between scanners is the inclusion or not of this PSF modeling capability during the reconstruction first. And the second most important factor would be if you have a digital PET compared with an analog PET uh, where photomultiplier tubes are replaced with the uh, solid state uh, sensors. Okay, thanks. And then we have a, questions, a question from the audience um, from a clinician point of view. Um, so in clinics, um, we often wish to scan patients who are restless and um, it's sometimes difficult to, for them to lie quietly for 20 minutes or so. Um, would then um, higher dose of radio ligand shorten the scanning time also for, for post-processing reason, reason? And would that be um, safe regarding the patient safety? Well, uh, from a pure technological point of view with modern scanners, which are based on LSO scintillators with fast electronics, time and activity are practically inter interchangeable, meaning that if you double the activity you could lower to one half the scan time but that would lead to the double of uh, radiation exposure to the patient so one potential solution for that problem of patient motion uh, could be to acquire the image in dynamic mode uh, where you get the series of frames a long time instead of one single static image and then if the patient moves perform an intra-patient uh, spatial registration to the first image for example and in that way, you could mitigate the effect of patient motion if present. Okay, thank you. And uh, maybe a follow-up question related to this, um, going in the other direction, um, how about reducing the amount of radiation and increasing, um, for example, post-processing steps or amount of iteration done? So if you would Sorry. reduce, if you would reduce the amount of radio, radio ligand given, would mm -hmm. you be able to um, gain the same quality of image with additional um, reconstruction? Not or with reconstructions. You could, you should increase the acquisition time, uh, I, unless you have a, some particular of advanced post-processing capabilities available, such as AI-enabled reconstructions, which I didn't mention in this talk. 
or some adaptive denoise scheme, which could potentially decrease the radiation dose without affecting image quality. In the traditional sense with typical reconstruction technologies, no, you have to double the, the acquisition time to have the same image quality. Okay, thank you. Um, and I don't think we have any further questions from the audience. So uh, thanks once again uh, for the presentation. Well, thank, thank you for, for inviting me to the talk. And um, then I'm um, first, I'd like you just to um, direct uh, the audience to um, look at the poll at, at the live stream site. And now I would um, hand the word to my co-chair, um, Professor Trost, to introduce our next speaker. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Matei. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome and announce the next speaker, Katharina Schindelbeck. Um, she is a, a German medical doctor currently working in New York at the Feinstein Institute for Medical Research. Um, and uh, her research topic are um, functional networks in neurodegenerative disorders. And I'm really looking forward to her talk about the cognition related functional topographies in Parkinson's disease and uh, relation to ventral default mode network. Katarina, please. Hi, thank you very much, uh, Maya. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can, but. Yeah, thank you very much for having me here today. I'm really excited to present um, my recent work on um, cognitive networks um, that can help us to better understand cognitive decline in patients with Parkinson's disease. Although um, Parkinson's disease is primarily a movement disorder, cognitive um, symptoms are very common among these patients. Um, to give you an example, um, 10 years after being diagnosed, um, the majority of PD patients will develop um, dementia. And the underlying mechanisms are not very well understood so far. And for example, we don't know why some patients remain cognitively unimpaired for quite some time, while other patients um, develop um, cognitive impairment fairly soon. Um, we know that um, cognitive decline is associated with um, changes in resting state networks and in different um, neurodegenerative diseases. And apart from that, um, there are also disease or cognition related networks that um, are associated with the clinical phenotype. And um, those networks can be quantified at the single subject level. Um, and the um, expression coral, um, increases with um, disease progression. Both um, normal resting state networks as well as those disease related networks are associated with upstream and downstream disease processes. And therefore um, they represent um, valuable imaging biomarkers that can um, be used in um, the early stage of the disease. And for example, um, they can be helpful in clinical trials. In addition to um, the assessment of clinical symptoms, they can be used to um, assess um, efficacy of treatments. In this study, um, we looked at a cross-sectional um, data set of over 150 PD patients that were um, scanned um, with FDP, FDEG PET and um, cognitively assessed uh, with a um, large cognitive battery. And um, these patients had different degrees of cognitive decline. And as you can see on the left side, the um, PD cognitive related pattern, short PDCP, 
did increase stepwise with worsening cognitive um, function. So it was um, significantly higher in patients with single domain MCI compared to those um, who were cognitively unimpaired and um, increased further in those with multiple domain MCI and were highest in those that were diagnosed with um, Parkinson's disease dementia. On the right hand side, um, you can see the parallel changes that um, happened in the default mode network. We see a um, decrease of um, expression values in those groups as the um, um, cognition um, gets worse. And um, when you look, have a look at the um, uh, brain slices shown here, there um, is a um, topographic overlap of those two networks. So we asked ourselves, is the increase that we see in the PV cognitive related pattern, is it just loss of um, the DMN that we're seeing here? Or um, is, this, um, uh, is there more to that? To answer this question, we um, switched modalities. We now um, um, assessed a um, PD group um, consisting of 25 PD patients that were scanned with resting state fMRI and um, also underwent cognitive um, uh, assessment. And we used, um, those patients were mid-stage disease. They were all non-demented and had a disease duration of around six, on average, uh, six years. We used independent component analysis and dual regression um, to identify a functional PDCP in this cohort um, from Berlin. And um, you can see um, that this um, pattern was characterized by activity increases and decreases in frontoparietal regions, as well as mediotemporal um, regions. It is defined by a um, uh, correlation um, between um, the expression values and um, verbal memory. And um, we then um, found that the um, expression values of this network were also significantly increased in patients with MCI in this group um, compared to those that were cognitively unimpaired. We then um, we're interested whether um, this network is stable and we validated this network in a separate data set. So we um, took the FPDCP from Berlin and um, did a forward application in a data set of 25 patients from New York that were also scanned with resting state fMRI. And um, we were able um, to show that um, the um, expression values um, um, correlated well with both um, verbal um, memory and verbal um, learning um, tests in this data set. And then we did a second step of validation. We used a previously described um, functional um, PDCP in, from New York and did a forward application of this um, pattern in the Berlin data set. And again, we were able to um, show that um, the um, correlations with um, clinical performance um, were um, significant. Um, as I said before, we were particularly interested in the relationship of the um, PDCP with um, the default mode network. So using the um, independent component analysis, we were able to identify three DMN subnetworks in our um, sample. The ventral DMN um, that is shown here on the left side with the precuneus and PCC as key regions, a posterior DMN and a, a anter a, an anterior part of the DMN. And this is in line with um, previously um, described um, DMN subnetworks in healthy controls. And we then um, looked into um, the regional overlap of these subnetworks with the FPDCP. And um, as you can see here, um, 
um, in, in the second row, the um, ventral DMN showed a very close um, topographic relationship with the FPDCP and Berlin with an R of 0.9. And um, by contrast, the posterior and the anterior DMN um, did not um, correlate or did only show a very weak um, correlation or no correlation with the functional um, PDCP. When we now go back to, um, yeah, and then we were also able to, um, um, to show that the um, expression values of this um, ventral part of the DMN were um, um, decreased in patients that had um, single domain MCI compared to those who were cognitively unimpaired. Then when we go back to the um, PDCP topography um, that was identified in the Berlin sample, it was composed of three um, different components. And the very left one um, is this um, um, characterized by activity decreases that correlate with um, worse performance in verbal recall. And this is um, the one that is um, um, highly um, correlated with the ventral DMN. But um, there were um, additional to this um, uh, component, there were two other um, components that were characterized by activity increases um, located here in the prefrontal and parietal cortex um, that also correlated with what we recall. And the mediotemporal um, uh, component here on the right hand side. Those three components um, form again the um, FPDCP that um, we show here. So um, we can uh, conclude that the ventral DMN with the PCC and the precuneus um, are very um, important key regions um, for the PDCP topography um, in early cognitive impairment. And, um, but there um, were um, again more um, um, regions involved in this topography. And um, we have to keep in mind that the um, um, patients, um, the data set used here um, it was non-demented. Um, so maybe the um, other DMN regions that I showed, anterior and posterior, they may play a role in later stages um, of cognitive decline. We also um, were able to show here that the PDCP topography is a very stable um, um, marker as it um, is replicable across different imaging methods um, with FDG PET and resting state fMRI. Um, both, um, uh, both modalities show very um, consistent um, topographies, which was also rep replicable in independent cohorts in New York and Berlin. It was also independent of the dopaminergic treatment status um, as the um, cohort in Berlin was scanned on levodopa, while as the um, cohort from uh, New York was um, off levodopa. So um, the PDCP um, um, expression can be um, quantified at the single subject level, and therefore um, it is um, represents a um, valuable and interesting um, marker for cognitive function in Parkinson's disease patients that um, could be used, um, uh, for example, in clinical trials to assess um, treatment um, effects. And, um, but it could also um, be an interesting marker to be used in a more um, broader clinical setting in the future um, that uh, can assess early cognitive uh, changes in uh, patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, that said, uh, um, I would like to uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I would like to thank my mentor, David Eidelberg at the Feinstein Institute, and also Anne Wu, who did a lot of the computational um, work um, for this project. And also um, my former colleagues at the Charité in Berlin that helped recruit, recruiting um, patients and um, did uh, some of the clinical work. 
And of course, um, I'd like to acknowledge my funding um, institutions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Katarina, for presenting your, your recent research. Um, uh, we have a short uh, time for discussion, so I will use this opportunity and ask you something. Uh, when you're presenting the functional MRI PDCP pattern, I think it was the Berlin one, I noted that it was quite asymmetric. Um, we know that Parkinson's disease is asymmetric, but uh, what about cognition in Parkinson's disease? What does this asymmetry mean, actually? Can, do you have any, any thoughts about that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so um, among different patterns, there um, can be some asymmetry, some asymmetry. Um, in this case, um, it could be due um, that um, these patients were um, early um, in, in terms of the cognitive um, decline. So um, I think if one would use more advanced patients, you would get a more symmetric um, uh, um, uh, pattern um, on the one hand. And um, yeah, I think... Um, Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Katarina. I would like to encourage the uh, audience to send uh, any possible, any further questions um, to us uh, um, in a written, written mode, uh, because we would have to move to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Katarina. And I think we are moving now from New York to Pamplona, Spain. Um, hello. Okay. Hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> hello, Hi, Gloria. Hello. Uh, can you see my screen? We can. How, how is Pamplona today? Pretty good. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, thank can you, you see my screen? Or um, share? Thank you for joining. Let me first introduce you. Uh, Gloria, uh, Gloria Marti Andres is an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery at the University of Navarra, Pamplona, Spain. She is also a neuroscientist and she will present us her exciting work on, um, um, on uh, different uh, types of uh, atypical Parkinsonism called PSP through the window of metabolic uh, characteristics. Uh, Gloria, I think you have to share the screen. Okay, perfect. Can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening to everyone. My name is Gloria Marti Andres. Um, first of all, I would like to, to thank the conference committee for inviting me. In this talk, I'm going to present to you our research about the, the metabolic correlates in PSP clinical subtypes. Okay, sorry. Okay, as uh, it has said before, um, progressive supranuclear palsy is a primary tauopathy associated with heterogeneous spectrum of clinical features. These clinical features include a variable combination of behavioral, cognitive, cognitive and motor phenomena. These features were included in the current clinical criteria defining different PSP subtypes. However, these criteria are not specific enough at early stages. Therefore, early diagnostic biomarkers are needed. Thus, to finally determine the more accurate bio biomarker, we studied the physiopathology of the disease. PSP is considered a dynamic disease rather than a stationary condition. In fact, some patients initially manifest a non-classic PSP subtype and eventually develop a common full symptomatic stage as the disease progresses. In this talk, we will refer to this phenomenon as phenotypic convergence. Moreover, if a phenotypic convergence implies clinical similarities among PSP patients, it may underlie common regional distribution of functional findings, which in turn could be used as a, bio as a biomarker. Therefore, our research has focused on three main objectives, which are 
first to evaluate the clinical evolution of our cohort of PSP and determine if there is a phenotypic convergence among them. Then we evaluated the possible correlations of the regional glucose metabolism. Secondly, we evaluate the brain glucose metabolism in each subtype to understand the metabolic similarities and differences in, sub in PSP subtypes. And finally, we define a common metabolic PSP-related pattern and evaluated its diagnostic accuracy. So we performed a longitudinal retrospective multicenter study that included a cohort of 72 patients with a final clinical diagnosis of PSP. These patients had been referred for a FDG PET scan to aid in the differential diagnosis of a Parkinsonian syndrome. Additionally, we included the patients and health subjects as reference groups. Regarding the FDG PET images, we defined four cohorts based on the PET procedures. The images were especially normalized on the standard template, properly smooth, and for the objective one and two, uh, we normalized by the global mean activity. For a better understanding, further methodological details will be explained in each section. Regarding the clinical characteristics in the three main clinical groups, PSP patients were slightly older than PD patients and showed a more severe disease with higher motor impairment and functional disability despite similar disease duration. Among PSP subtypes, patients with a final clinical diagnosis of Richardson syndrome showed a shorter disease duration without significant differences in motor impairment nor functional disability at the time the PET was performed. To evaluate the phenotypic convergence among PSP subtypes, we analyzed the longitudinal expression of the PSP core fetus. Interestingly, the different PSP subtypes showed a parallel clinical progression with differences in the time of onset regarding the oculomotor and postural instability, instability clinical domains. Compared to Richardson syndrome, the Parkinsonian subtype showed a significant, significant delayed onset on both oculomotor and postural instability domains. And progressive gate freezing subtype showed a similar onset on postural instability, but a delayed onset on an ocul oculomotor domain. Moreover, frontal and behavioral dysfunction was frequent along the disease, with a slight but not significant delayed onset between Richardson syndrome and Parkinsonian subtypes. These features were less frequent and emerged later in progressive gate freezing subtype. Finally, Corticobasal syndrome was more frequent in Richardson syndrome subtype than the other subtypes. So we confined the phenotypic convergence and then we analyzed the metabolic correlations using a volume of interest analysis. For this purpose, we selected the AL3 atlas. Then we performed a generalized estimate equation model to estimate and then records out the effect on the, of the pet procedures on the raw activity data. After the proper correction, we compare the mean glucose activity per boy between clinical groups using a Pearson's correlation. So we found that the mean activity per boy correlations were very strong, the red ones, uh, or strong between the different clinical subtypes. However, they were weak when compared each subtype with PD patients. The figure on the top illustrates the glucose metabolism per boy relative to healthy subjects. As you can see, PSP subtypes showed a parallel activity dynamic for almost all cortical and subcortical boys. In addition, PSP subtypes showed a similar degree of activity impairment in subcortical, in subcortical and cerebellar voice. The main differences among PSP subtypes were seen in the degree of impairment in cortical voice, with a gradient from, from more severe Richardson syndrome subtype to less severe progressive gate freeze, uh, progressive gate freezing subtype. So, to analyze which of those regions showed a significant metabolic differences between subtypes and healthy subjects, we use the, we use the SPM software implemented on my lab. 
We perform an ANCOVA analysis using a SCOVA variate, the sex, age, and pet procedures, and apply a multiple comparison comparisons, uh, correction. Compared with, uh, with healthy, uh, healthy subjects, we saw similar regions involved in the three subtypes. Differences were seen in, first, in the anterior putamen, particularly in the Parkinsonian subtype, and also, <coughs> sorry, in the severity of the regional involvement that was more severe in the Richardson syndrome subtype. However, as you can see, when the multiple comparison correction is applied, most of these results fail to overcome the statistical threshold. So this analysis helped us to, to see where the differences were, however, shows low statistical power. So as we have seen uh, similar metabolic regional dynamics among PSP subtypes, we propose that a common Im imaging uh, biomarker could be useful to differentiate PSP subtypes from PD and healthy sub. For that purpose, we use the scale supervised model and principal component analysis to obtain a PSP related pattern. The identification cohort contains a representation of the three subtypes. So we obtain this pattern, the, the pattern map, and the pattern map confirm the, that the regions, or the regions previously observed uh, as involved in PSP were also part of a functional network. Moreover, we apply the pattern into identification court and also a three, uh, three independent courts and observe that uh, an op and we observe an optimal diagnostic accuracy to differentiate both PSP patients from both PD patients and healthy controls. More in detail, patterns expression discriminated the Richardson syndrome and the Parkinsonian patients from P both PD patients and healthy subjects. However, despite showing high patterns expression in PSP progressive date freezing subtype, it was not significantly different from PD and healthy subjects, probably due, due to the small sample of this subgroup subtype. Thus, we can conclude that despite initial clinical heterogeneity among the PSP subtypes, we observe a trend for converging towards a fully symptomatic stage that encompasses oclomotor dysfunction, postural instability, and in most cases, a executive or behavioral syndrome. Moreover, PSP subtypes show similar regional metabolic dynamics. We support the longitudinal clinical parallelism detected among them. Particularly, a Richardson syndrome subtype shows the most severe and greatest station of the metabolic disturbances, whereas Parkinsonian subtype shows an intermediate position, and progressively increasing subtype shows the less expressive metabolic uh, disturbances. Finally, we also conclude that the common PSP-related pattern is a useful and reproducible supportive diagnostic tool for differentiated PSP subtypes from PD and healthy subjects. Finally, I would like to thank my colleagues from Groningen and Pamplona and also the audience for their attention. Good evening. Thank you very much, uh, Gloria, for Thank you. presenting this work that clinicians uh, see every day in our clinical practice, actually. Um, I wanted to show you, you said that you uh, decided to identify the PSP pattern on all patients uh, together. You didn't divide them by type, is that right? No. And why was that? Is it because you didn't have enough? Or, uh, I mean, did you still try to, to find a pattern of specific subtype? We because, tried, I mean, because the clinicians would, as a clinician, you would wonder whether there are different subtype patterns of, of PSP. Yeah, of course, but uh, we have to know. Uh, first of all, uh, it was the, the same. Uh, they, we put all together because we saw uh, similar dynamics, uh, but also because of the, we tried to do the different patterns in each subtype, but uh, we had four uh, two scanners in, and two centers, so four cohorts. 
It means that uh, it's to about 20 patients per court, and mainly they are a uh, Richardson syndrome subtype. So uh, about the, we don't have enough patients uh, from Parkinsonian and progressive case facing subtypes in each uh, in each court to obtain a, 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 a particular a pattern of each subtype and then to try to compare. That's why we also apply the SPM, the univariate analysis, to assess which were more or less the similarities and the differences between, between the subtypes. But it was because these are quite rare uh, subtypes. The most common is the Richardson syndrome. Uh, but the progressive case friction is a very rare subtype. And it, uh, we, I think that we have seen at least five or six in our neurologist career. So it's quite difficult to, to find them and to, to have a, an FDG pet in the same pet camera and the same acquisition parameters. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for this uh, uh, detailed answer. But um, the fact that on SPM analysis, you did find um, different characteristics in these subtypes. This if this somehow predict that if the sample would be big enough, you should probably get also different patterns, right? Or 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 not? What do you think? Yes, but the main uh, oh, it's uh, it's true. Uh, the Parkinsonian variant shows an asymmetric, more asymmetric pattern, and also uh, affects the anterior part of the putamen, and that it it makes sense. And the progressive increasing, increasing affects the subcort mainly the subcortical uh, nuclei that is similar to the neuropathological findings, but uh, somehow uh, they, the, 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 they, the sim, they um, share similar nucleus in the subcortical area. And they, it was our hypothesis to, to apply like a pattern that, and they only differ in the extension and the intensity of the metabolic disturbances. Of course, uh, for the rare uh, subtypes, perhaps it's not so good as we have seen with the progressive gate freezing subtype. Thank you very much, Gloria, for sharing your results with us. Um, and bye-bye <laughs> bye -bye to Spain. Uh, and um, we will proceed with our uh, presentation. And we are now back uh, to Ljubljana. And it's uh, my great pleasure to present, not to present because you already know him, my co-chair, uh, Matej Peroni, who is a PhD uh, student. And uh, he will present us uh, the results of his Richard's re recent research results on the metabolic characteristic of two common dementias and whether they can help us differentiate among them. Matej, please. Okay. Okay, so let me share my screen. Um, <clears throat> thank you for a nice introduction. I think uh, this talk I'll address our research work on specific metabolic brain patterns in Alzheimer's dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies. And just a short background. So dementia due to Alzheimer's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies are the two most common neurodegenerative dementias. Um, but since there is substantial overlap in clinical presentation, and as we'll later see also, um, in the underlying pathology or topography of where the changes happen, uh, misdiagnosis is common. And therefore, different biomarkers can be used um, to aid and are used um, in, uh, in clinics for the dementia differential diagnosis, such as cerebrospinal fluid or imaging biomarkers. And in this talk, I'll focus um, on metabolic brain imaging with FDG PET and more specifically on specific metabolic brain patterns of which we have heard a bit um, in the previous two talks. Um, and in the, in the dementia field, they have been identified before, but not for all dementias. Mm. And this was also one of the aims of our study. 
So in the first aim, we aim to identify and validate a quantifiable neuroimaging bar marker of AD or Alzheimer's um, dementia, ADRP, in biomarker-confirmed AD patients. ADRP has been identified um, before, but only on, in patients diagnosed based on the clinical uh, presentation, which, have, um, which might have reduced the out-of-sample validity of these patterns. And furthermore, we aim to identify and validate a quantifiable neuroimaging biomarker also of DLB, so-called DLB-related pattern or DLBRP. And then lastly, we studied the relationship between these two metabolic brain patterns. So for the pattern identification, we used an um, SSM-PCA procedure or scale saprophile model, which is based on principal component analysis. Let me just uh, schematically um, introduce you to the concept here. Um, so we, we have two groups of individuals, one the diseased and then the healthy group. And if we scan the two groups and we can then combine the scans into one um, group or one matrix, we can then apply the principal component analysis of the combined group of scans to find or delineate these features or principal components that are uh, specific either for the diseased or the healthy individuals. And by doing this, we obtain a network imaging biomarker, which is comprised of regions of relatively reduced metabolic activity denoted in blue and co-varying regions of increased metabolic activity denoted in red. And furthermore, what's also important, we can then prospectively quantify this pattern um, using the topographic profile rating algorithm or TPR. So if we have an additional patient which was not included in the identification um, procedure, we can then scan her and check whether or not that patient expresses um, the pattern in question. And then we can um, calculate the Z-score of this individual patient by calculating the internal vector product between the patient scan and the DLB related pattern. And we can compare the patient's expression based to um, groups of normal and diseased individuals. So moving on to the results section, um, first I'd like to share you the first part about Alzheimer's disease related pattern. Um, for this um, part of the study, we included for the identification cohort, um, 20 individuals with AD and 20 uh, normal controls. Uh, but bear in mind that the say AD individuals were confirmed based on the CSF analysis. Then we used an internal validation data set <clears throat> of additional 43 AD individuals, 20 normal controls, and 15 patients with behavior variants of frontotemporal dementia. And also an external validation data set to show that this pattern identified um, from in this patient um, also survive, also is useful um, in external validation data sets. And this is how the ADRP pattern looks like. Um, it comprised of um, regions of relatively reduced metabolic activity and relatively increased metabolic activity. And we can look at how this pattern is expressed. So um, by using the Z scores, uh, the, with the topographic profile rating method that I have um, introduced before. And we can see that the pattern is highly expressed in the identification group and also in the internal validation and the two external validation groups. And what we have also shown is that the Z scores of the pattern are negatively correlated with, um, pa with patients' global, global cognition. Um, by using MMSC or MOCA scores in those individuals who are mildly demented. Then the next step of our study, uh, we try to identify uh, dementia with Lewy bodies related pattern or DLBRP. And um, for this, we use 20 individual, individuals with probable DLB and 20 healthy controls uh, to identify the specific metabolic pattern and then in an internal validation data set of 61 individuals with probable DLB and 63 um, individuals with AD uh, that were um, mentioned before. So after applying um, SSM PCA method, we identified DLBRP, which is comprised of regions of relatively reduced metabolic activity, um, occipitally, parietally, 
uh, inferior temporal lobes and relatively increased um, metabolic activity in cerebellum, basal ganglia, um, parahypocampal and hypocampal areas. And we can see that this pattern is highly expressed in the identification DLB participants, but also in the um, internal validation data set. Although what we also see is that the pattern is also exp expressed in individuals with Alzheimer's disease. And we look um, then the, in the next step, uh, we looked at the topographic overlap between the two patterns. So if we see ADRP on the left and DLBRP on the right, um, we can already observe that they are similar. And um, here I'm just um, showing you a few slices um, denoting the regions of topographic overlap between the two patterns, denoted here in purple. And in the next step, uh, what we did was we used an orthogonalization procedure to remove ADRP from the DLBRP. And after removing this AD component, uh, what we are left of is um, regions that are more specific to DLB. And we can also observe this looking at the z-scores of this newly identified pattern. This is still highly expressed in the identification cohort, in the DLB validation cohort, but now uh, the AD individuals are on the same level with um, healthy controls. And if we, um, if we take one um, look back, uh, comparing the, the expression of the original DLB pattern or after removing the AD, we can see that only parts specific to DLB remain in this pattern and thus improving the separation between the two groups. Furthermore, we also looked at the DLB patients with and without the Alzheimer's pathology. And um, to do this, we use CSF analysis um, and we stratified um, patients, those that are probable DLB uh, based on the clinical diagnosis and uh, had abnormal amyloid versus those that at normal amyloid levels. And firstly, we observed that ADRP expression, uh, which is related to the Alzheimer's pathology, uh, was highly expressed um, in, so in the Alzheimer's, um, so DLB with Alzheimer's pathology, but not in those who did not have, non, uh, who did not have Alzheimer's pathology. And when we um, address this ADRP expression, we can now observe that the two groups um, are still this, uh, now the same based on their DLBRP expression. So that's removing the Alzheimer's pathology, but remains is, um, is specific for the DLB. And to conclude, um, in this research, we have shown that DLBRP is a specific metabolic biomarker of DLB. And we have also shown that there is some overlap uh, between DLBRP. Uh, we speculate that this is um, not just based on the topographic overlap, but also on the sharing um, underlying pathophysiologi pathophysiological processes um, in amyloid and tau deposition. And after accounting for the overlapping variants, only regions that were specific to DLB um, remain. And we can use this pattern um, to accurately distinguish between the two diseases. And with this, um, I'd like to also acknowledge um, my colleagues um, from the institution here in Ljubljana, uh, from the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research and Medical Physics Research Group. I'd like to thank the audience for their attention and be willing to tackle on some questions. Um, thank you very much, Matei, for your timely uh, presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask you something again from a, from a clinician point of view. If somebody would ask you now after you, are, uh, you presented these results and you've done all this analysis, do you believe that Parkinson's disease dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies is the same in syndrome, just a little different, or do you think these are two different entities? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, so in regard of Parkinson's disease dementia, we, um, so we see an even larger um, pathological and clinical overlap. And uh, we did some preliminary results um, showing that this um, DLB part that is specific um, 
to the DLB um, is more expressed uh, in DLB patients in, in, uh, and not in the patients with Parkinson's disease dementia. And also um, coming back to the uh, Katerina's talk, um, we have some preliminary results showing that the um, PDCP or Parkinson's disease cognitive pattern um, is uh, something that's um, correlated with cognitive decline only in PDD patients, but not um, reflecting cognitive impairment in DLB patients. So based on our data, we would see that the two, di the two diseases are distinct, um, have a distinct networks involved in their um, cognitive impairment. Okay, thank you. But could you, could you say is DLB more similar to AD, to Alzheimer disease, or to its cousin Parkinson disease, based on your results? Um, yeah, based on uh, this that we have, that I have shown um, before, we can um, clearly see that there is an AD component present in DLBRP. Um, but what we also found is that the PD component is um, also present and even, and even more, um, more so. Um, thank you very much, Tom, uh, Matei. <laughs> and I'm already welcoming um, Tomas. Uh, Tomas Rus is also a PhD student and a neurologist uh, from the Department of Neurology in Ljubljana. Uh, and he spent uh, quite some time over the last year in the at the neuropathology department searching for some uh, correlation between metabolic pattern and the pathology of uh, sporadic carotid Jacob disease. Um, Tomas, please, we are looking forward to your results. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present our project on side-by-side -side correlation between brain metabolism and pathological changes in sporadic carotid Jacob disease. Um, Kreutzer Jacobs disease is a progressive neurodegenerative disorder um, pathologically characterized by prime protein accumulation, by spongiform changes for vocalization, by neuronal loss, gliosis, and by um, microglial activation. It is actually a unique, um, it is unique among neurodegenerative disorders for its very rapid progression with median survival of just about a few months. And um, due to the met cow disease epidemic in the 90s, which is a related but not the same disorder, autopsy is publicated by law. So rapid progression on one side and pathological diagnosis on the other makes CGD a perfect in vivo model of neurodegeneration in general. <clears throat> CGD eventually presents with progressive dementia. However, early signs are very diverse. And moreover, spatial distribution um, of pathological changes um, is diverse as well and depends on subtype and disease duration. However, our group previously found um, consistent changes in brain metabolism measured by FDGPET among patients. And even further, we identified and validated a robust CGD-related multivariate pattern um, called CGBDRP. We actually use the same procedure um, as Matei um, described before. So therefore, the aim of this project was to correlate side-by-side -side brain metabolism and pathological changes in Kreutzer Jacobs disease in the same patients. <laughs> We included um, 16 pathologically confirmed CGD patients and 16 age matched normal controls. Um, all the subjects underwent FDG PET imaging to obtain um, plain FDG PET. Um, and images were then pre processed in SPM and then underwent region of interest analysis. We have chosen um, 12 strategic regions based on CGDRP pattern. The regions um, that were either very impaired 
or um, most preserved. So um, these regions were then this court um, according to normal controls. After this, um, 16 patients unfortunately died. Um, brain samples were obtained um, from the same 12 strategic regions. These um, samples were then um, paraffin embedded and stained by hematoxylin azine, um, immunohistochemically um, stained against prime protein and against activated microglia to show inflammation. After the hematoxylin eosin samples um, or, or the um, hematoxylin eosin samples were assessed for vacuolization by three independent examiners. Um, samples treated um, uh, against prime protein were assessed as well by these three independent examiners and also by automated assessment, computer-based assessment um, using um, CUPF software. Samples treated with antibody against activated microglia were assessed with both methods as well. So um, after the um, lab work was done, um, we were interested first in consistency of metabolic and pathological changes um, among patients. With other words, um, our question was, is there any spatial pattern in metabolism, in vacuolization, in prime load, or in inflammation? The second question was, do metabolic changes correlate with pathological changes on a group level? We investigated it um, using sperm or person um, correlation. And the third question was, do metabolic changes correlate with pathological changes on a single subject level? Um, for this purpose, we built multivariate mixed linear models. So regarding consistency of um, spatial distribution, um, the region of interest analysis showed consistent pattern in brain metabolism across regions, as you can see from this chart, and um, as it was also expected from our previous research. The consistency was substantial and highly significant. However, um, the consistency was considerably lower for vacuolization, as may be seen um, already visually from this chart, um, and achieved only pair consistency. Moreover, um, spatial distribution was even more variable for prime load and for inflammation. Um, consistency was only slight um, as shown with single score interface correlation test. So, Second, do metabolic changes correlate with pathological changes on a group level? We found significant correlation between vacuolization and regional metabolism. However, um, it explained only about 40% of variance. On the other hand, we did not find a significant correlation between prime load or microglial um, activation and um, original brain metabolism. What was interesting um, in this part of the study and is definitely worth studying the future is that um, there were clear clusters regarding histological and embryological properties of brain regions, as you can see um, on this chart. So then we tested the same question on a single subject level with mixed linear models. And once again, um, we found highly significant, um, a highly significant effect of vacuolization on metabolism. Again, the effect of prime load did not affect metabolism, but 
there was there was some marginal effect of inflammation of metabolism. So with this project, our group showed that um, Kreutzer Jacobs disease seems to consistently affect brain metabolism despite inconsistent pathological changes. And that pathological process seems to universally affect um, a consistent um, brain network regardless of pathological spatial pattern. These findings may be extended also to other neurodegenerative disorders, of course, with appropriate um, caution. Um, uh, Gloria um, uh, I mean, has already um, thought about um, uh, this in her talk and also um, Matei mentioned it um, um, at the end at the comments. So um, in the future, we intend to continue this project to study correlation between CGDRP regions and pathological changes and also to start the CGDRP network connectivity according to pathological findings. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you very much, uh, Tomas, also for your very timely presentation. And um, I'm going to... Uh, take myself a privilege for this for the first question, and this is... Do you have any possible explanation or any idea why is this discrepancy uh, between pathological changes and brain metabolism um, so obvious in, in prion disease, but also in uh, other neurogenerative diseases I already mentioned? Yes. Well, it seems that pathological process affects a specific brain network um, regardless of where um, it begins. Um, we know from the study in Alzheimer's disease that um, uh, amyloid doesn't correlate um, with, um, um, it doesn't correlate with um, metabolic network um, disruption. Um, uh, Matteo also showed us that um, uh, there is similar, um, there is similar um, um, pattern in uh, Parkinson's disease and um, DLB. They are both um, alpha um, uh, synoclinopathies. So it seems that um, pathological uh, process um, has a specific, um, specific um, effect on uh, um, uh, network disruption. But we can also say it's a different pathologi patholo pathological processes uh, don't or do because it's different for tau uh, pathology, for example, in Alzheimer's disease, this, this one correlates quite well with the, um, with the brain metabolism. So uh, if you would have some pathologists in audience, it would be interesting to hear their, their opinion, certainly something um, that's a very desirable future topic of, of research. Um, with that, I would like to thank you, uh, Tomas, and I'm heading over to my co-chair, Matei, for the closing words. Matei, are you here? Yeah. Um, so thank, uh, thank you for um, attending uh, the presentations today. Um, thanks for all for, to the audience, obviously, and thanks to all the presenters once again. Uh, and um, thank you, for Professor Trosh, for co-chairing this event with me. Um, just a few guidelines for the audience um, for the next um, plenary lecture. So um, we have a 15 minutes break, break scheduled. And in the meantime, um, there is a poll. Uh, there will be a poll on the live site where you can fill out your data um, to gather the uh, CMA uh, credits um, for whoever is, is interested in those. And um, so we start again at 15 minutes past um, six with a very interesting um, plenary lecture from Professor Tilo van Eyman entangled. Um, so can, uh, what can the 
brain metabolism t- tell us about the neurodegeneration stories of putting some of these things we discussed and presented into a bit more broader um, perspective. 